Okay, so thank you so much. Um, thank you all for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I am from America, so I might have a different accent. Um, if you have any questions about what I'm saying, please feel free to raise your hand in the middle of the talk. If you have questions about the content, maybe save those for later. But definitely, if you're completely lost on something, let me know. Um, yeah, I'm from Texas originally in the US, uh, then California. Um, I actually, uh, interestingly enough, have ancestry in Norway. In the America, it's a big deal, like where your ancestors come from, because it's so ver uh, varied. Um, that's the only one that I know of besides uh, Cherokee, a, a Native American tribe that I'm from. So very excited to be here. Um, yeah, I'm in very involved in two social movements, effective altruism and animal rights, animal welfare, animal protection. Um, I'm going to talk about the intersection of those today. Um, I'm not sure exactly who the audience is. Um, so who all thinks that they could give a like one paragraph description of effective altruism if somebody asked them right now? Just raise your hand if you think you could do that. Okay, cool. So some, some people who are engaged with effective altruism, some people maybe not so much. Um, I'm going to cover, I guess, uh, quite a different level of, of content. So some of it might be kind of advanced and kind of require some, some basics. Um, but I'll try to kind of cater to different people. Again, just stop me if, if I throw out terminology that you're unfamiliar with or anything. Um, so to start off, just for fun, um, this chicken is actually, uh, her name is Snow. Um, she's my chicken. I'm about to go see her in California again. I haven't seen her in quite a while, um, so I'm excited to do so. She was rescued from a battery cage farm, so uh, an egg farm where they have very tiny cages that the animals are confined in, um, in California, um, rescued about two years ago. Um, she was debeaked, as you can see, but now she's very happy. Um, she likes posing for photos. Um, she doesn't really know, but she likes the attention, I think. Um, and uh, she's a big inspiration to me. So I adopted her after I was you know, very committed to the animal cause, but definitely to keep me motivated and everything. Um, thinking about the individual animals we're fighting for is very important. Um, so basic outline. These are kind of different EA concepts that I'm going to walk through, effective altruism concepts. Um, so first is cause prioritization. I'll discuss that in the context of farmed animals and touch on a couple different areas. Then intervention. So how do we actually, uh, once we've decided to help animals, go out and do it? What are the most effective ways to do so? I'm going to discuss a little bit about the far future. So um, it's a popular and effective altruism to consider the very long run impact of our actions, not just how we can you know, help a few animals today, but how can we for example, build a society that is robustly um, caring about the welfare of animals, you know, so that in, in the long run, we'll treat them as well as possible. Um, I'll discuss, uh, can't really say too much about that now, but just two different arguments that I want to make that are kind of the frontier of effective altruism for animals uh, research today. And then at the end, I'll discuss some practical tips about how you can go out and help um, after this presentation. So first, uh, discussing why we should help animals. Um, the number one criteria uh, uh, of why it's so compelling is the scale. Um, so this is a picture of a fish caught in a large net. Um, fish suffer in extremely large numbers. And uh, there's scientific evidence that uh, fish show most of the um, either fa uh, facets, um, either characteristics and features of consciousness, or at least um, uh, behavior and uh, neuroanatomy, so the, the features of their brains that indicate consciousness. Um, so given their suffering in such large numbers um, from things like um, being dragged up from the bottom of the ocean, it seems very important. But most of the time we, we think about land animals more so. Um, so this, you know, don't feel the need to read all of it, but I'll highlight a few points. It's kind of some of the suffering that farmed animals endure. Um, I'm not an expert on Norway. I mean, I, I'm, I know nothing about Norway. Um, it's perhaps a more honest answer to that. Um, but in different European countries, uh, there's a huge variety of, of welfare factors. But when it comes to the, you know, the, the 90 plus percent of animals in the world today, um, I think it's, it's safe to say most of them endure uh, all or almost all of these. So the first one I'd, I'd highlight is dysfunctional relationships, something we don't usually think about, but um, in an in a egg-laying hen farm like this, um, the chickens are unable to establish the social order they'd uh, like to do, so a pecking order if you've heard of that. Um, they want to have you know, clear dominance hierarchies um, and clearly know, you know where they fit and feel comfortable in that, even if they're you know, submissive or lower on the order. Um, in industrial farming, they don't get to form these uh, families, these uh, communities, and instead they're just very stressed out and very frustrated um, almost constantly. Um, we talk about uh, helping transition from cage farms to uh, cage-free farms. It's a big humane reform push, um, but one of the downsides of that, unfortunately, 
is that as you get into these big cage-free communities, so a big open shed, um, you have even more of this uh, suffering going on because it's even harder to establish that pecking order. Um, another unfortunate one is painful death before slaughter. So chickens raised for meat, um, they're different, uh, different breed uh, from chickens raised for eggs. Um, they can suffer from you know, cardiac arrest because they're growing so quickly because we want them to produce so much meat um, that their hearts just fail and they die before they can even be slaughtered. Um, and then of course, as you see below, others uh, witness those animals' deaths and get stressed out, um, uh, all sorts of bad things. Um, before they get to the slaughterhouse, they have uncomfortable transport. In many parts of the world, they're transported for you know, 12, 24, or even more hours without food and water um, in really bad weather conditions, whether it's the extreme heat, and you know, they're literally many of them are dying from heat stroke, or you know, hypothermia in the cold, or the rain, what have you. Um, very little protection. Um, there are very few laws protecting uh, transport. There are very few laws in the world as a whole for farmed animals. Um, and even when there are laws, those are very often broken. Um, so I'm not going to dwell on that too long. I'm going to discuss the next criteria for why we should uh, care a lot about farmed animals. Um, so this is even within the animal cause when we're thinking about you know, uh, companion animals, so cats and dogs, pets who live at home with us, compared to farmed animals like chickens or fish or cows or pigs. 99.8% um, of those animals are the farmed ones. Um, however, the donations allocated are 99% towards the cats and dogs. Um, and this uh, misalignment, this um, uh, poor distribution of resources um, is both very bad, it means there are lots of farmed animals suffering, but it's also a huge opportunity. It means that um, as thoughtful you know, do-gooders, as effective altruists, we can uh, come into this and try and help correct this balance in the, in the, in the system. Um, so we can help these large numbers of animals and help correct this balance. Um, farmed animals are a very neglected cause area. Um, we should also consider tractability, so not just is it a, a, a big cause, not just is it neglected by people, but can we actually do something about it? Um, I think we have a variety of evidence pointing towards tractability in this area. Uh, one, of those area uh, one of those pieces of evidence is historical social movements, um, so anti-slavery, women's rights, um, gay rights. Um, we've had a variety of social movements throughout history that have pushed for reforms for oppressed individuals, um, and many of them have been very successful. There's a, a huge debate in the historical literature about different movements and how much um, you know, activism has been a factor versus technology and different things, but it's safe to say that at least targeted, thoughtful activism has been a large contributor for many of these movements. Um, additionally, we have evidence of tractability from uh, marketing research, um, from social psychology research that shows how we can change individual behavior. So has anyone heard of the book Nudge or, or the idea? Yeah, um, very popular in like, uh, you know, progressive, uh, uh, well-educated circles in the U.S. It's the idea that we can nudge people and their behavior to make them have uh, vastly different choices, um, but with very minor uh, changes and ones that don't really intrude on their personal uh, freedom or uh, privacy or anything too much. So for example, if you want people to become organ donors, um, right now uh, in the US, for example, not many people are because it's an opt-in system. You have to say, I want to be an organ donor. And most people, even though if you ask them, you know, do you want to be an organ donor or not, they wouldn't say, oh, I don't want to be an organ donor. Um, they just don't do it. There's status quo bias. There's laziness in some sense um, that keeps people from opting in to, to, to donating their organs upon death when possible. Um, if we change that to an opt-out system or even to a forced uh, system where they have to choose, um, then we see that organ donation rates just, just skyrocket. Many people are willing to be organ donors um, but because uh, the way in which they're asked about it is, is, is um, the certain way it is, um, we don't get the uh, organ donation rates we'd like. So anyway, that's a very dis different example from helping animals, um, but it's an indication that kind of you know, small, targeted forms of activism or policy change can really uh, change behavior, uh, can change society in, in a significant way. Um, so the additional uh, perspective we can take on cause prioritization on why we should help animals or any other cause area is thinking quantitatively about actually, you know, let's crunch the numbers and try and figure out how much impact we can have. Um, and I'll cover that in, in, in just a few minutes. Um, so uh, those three criteria, I think, indicate um, a, a very promising cause area. I would also mention wild animals um, in one other area as just very important cause areas to keep in mind. I'm not going to go into depth. Um, so just as I talked about farmed animals, you know, dwarfing the number of other domestic animals, including companion animals, also those used in research, those used in clothing, um, wild animals dwarf in number 
uh, even farmed animals. There are so many of them, uh, and one of the reasons we don't usually realize this is because many of them are small. So we might look at biomass and say, well, cows are huge, there are so many of them. Um, but that's not a large number of individuals, that's a large number of, of, of you know, mass, it's a large number of fat individuals, I guess. Um, but wild animals, there are so many of them, and they're suffering in really significant ways. This is both human caused, so for example, um, grain agriculture, you know, whenever they have these large combines rolling through um, a field, they'll, they'll harm a large number of wild animals, it could be from pollution, uh, but it could also be from natural causes, so there's lots of, you know, starvation and illness and, and other issues in the wild. Um, and it's unclear, you know, what the tractability of this is, how much of an impact can we actually make, but for now at least I think we can um, consider the area, we can do research, figure out if there are uh, you know, safe interventions to help these wild animals. So people have already been doing this to some extent uh, for, for human reasons. Of course those aren't uh, the reasons we, we always want, but for example, they've, um, uh, did, they've done mass rabies vaccination um, to keep rabies from spreading to household pets. Um, and this has reduced the rabies incidence in wild populations, which has um, presumably, I don't, uh, people haven't looked into this a lot, increased their welfare significantly. Um, so we could do something similar, but actually for the welfare of these animals, for you know, the individuals themselves who matter in their own right. Um, additionally, legal personhood. So um, there have been initiatives in the US and elsewhere to get actual rights for uh, animals, specifically for primates. Um, they've also considered cetaceans like dolphins um, and elephants. Um, but for these charismatic creatures who uh, we have a pretty clear case, that, clear case that they have thoughts and feelings and desires and interests like we do. Um, and we can get them really fundamental legal protection that can just transform the way that they're viewed by society. So throughout history, I was talking about those previous social movements, we've been able to push various oppressed groups you know, through this legal barrier between things, between things like this table or this computer, and persons like you and me. Um, and by pushing them through, by pushing these, these, these primates through and other individuals, we can uh, reform the system for helping animals. Um, this is kind of speculative and it's kind of a long-term intervention from an EA perspective because we're really counting on that to then spread in the future to the, the very large populations like wild or farmed animals. Um, but it could be very significant just because of how transformative of a you know, paradigm shift it is. So if we're thinking about interventions, and actually from this quantitative perspective, how much good we can do um, through, through various areas, um, I want to discuss what kind of evidence we can use to, to figure out uh, which of these are most effective. Um, so first we can directly observe things. So we can directly observe when you know, an animal advocacy group uh, targets a company and tries to get them to change to, to cage-free to, cage um, practices. Um, this is something we can uh, see with individual outreach, so I can hand out leaflets to people and, and ask them, you know, did you change your mind? Um, maybe if they're a friend of mine, I can ask them a few months later, you know, are you now vegetarian and, and you know, helping these farmed animals? Um, this is really good evidence when we, when, we can, when we have it. Unfortunately, we don't have it very often, so we have to do things like experimentation. Um, so if I'm handing out leaflets, I can't just, you know, observe and follow every single person I, I hand a leaflet out to and see what their behavior changes to evaluate the effectiveness of that intervention. Instead, I can do a sample, so I can uh, run an experiment where I hand out leaflets to some people, I don't hand out leaflets to other people, and then uh, this, this, you know, randomized group, uh, a few months from now I ask them what their diet is, or I measure their diet by looking at, you know, grocery store data or something like this. This is the same way you would run an experiment and, you know, chemistry or biology or something. Um, and we can potentially use it to inform understanding of the effectiveness of these interventions. So actually, um, just a few hours ago, um, a new experiment came out in this field, um, which is really exciting. There aren't many of these. Um, looking at showing news articles to people online that had, um, here's some advocacy that's going on. It's, uh, people are campaigning to get um, consumers to reduce their consumption of animal products. This is exciting. You should be excited about it. And then uh, uh, later ask these people about their consumption of animal products. And it indicated that there was a significant effect. It did persist um, that these people were not only changing their attitudes in the moment, but actually changing their consumption down the road. Um, that's the first statistically significant and methodologically robust uh, animal advocacy trial to date. I think, um, so it's really exciting, and anyway, I just posted that on Facebook before this talk. Um, so, so really cool, it's an advancing field and we're getting more of this evidence. Um, we can also learn from history and case studies, like those social movements I discussed, also previous you know, campaigns we've ran. Let's say we've done something for you know, animals used for their fur, um, we can then translate the, the lessons from that to animals used for food. Um, finally, we have general psychology and sociology, um, which I'll discuss with an example. So this was a study that was done on uh, hotel towel reuse. 
So we want people when they're going to hotels, when possible, to reuse their towels. This saves energy, this saves, um, you know, reduces environmental damage, it even saves costs to the hotel themselves. Um, and we can convince people to do this by giving them an environmental message, which is just symbolically represented on the left. Um, tell people about that environmental benefit and tell them they should reuse their towels. But we could also take another approach, um, and this is what they did in this experiment. They uh, told people that many other people, 75% uh, of people in the hotel, are also reusing their towels. Um, they mentioned the environmental benefits but didn't go into depth, um, and then looked at what sort of behavior change these people had. Um, and if you're familiar with books like Nudge and this kind of social psychology literature, um, you can guess that people aren't very rational, they aren't listening to the actual facts, um, they don't make as much change in that situation. In fact, they make about 10% more participation in hotel towel reuse um, when you just tell them other people are doing it. You know, we're social creatures. They actually went a step further in this study and uh, told people, not just people in the hotel are reusing their, t their towels, but people who have stayed in your specific hotel room are reusing their towels. And this is not useful evidence. People in our hotel room are not you know, experts on hotel towel reuse. Um, but the effect went up even further, went up to about 49, 50%. Um, so we can translate this evidence to helping animals. For example, we can, uh, when we want people to go vegetarian or vegan, we can use messages like this. So this is an online advertisement, ran on Facebook, just shows up in your newsfeed, um, telling you Ariana Grande, who's a famous singer, um, is leaving meat off her plate and you should watch this video to see why. And this uses the same social appeal, so potentially it could be really effective. Um, but we actually want to crunch the numbers on this, and we've done so. Um, of course, there's a lot of speculation involved and a lot of uncertainty, and we can get into this in the Q&A if people are curious. Um, but we get something like one to 12, wrong slide, sorry, this isn't uh, converted. Um, one to 12 years of factory farm suffering spared per dollar. Um, really huge figures. Um, and this is, this is a massive change when we think about with our own diets, we might be able to spare you know, only a few years of factory farm suffering um, with a year of ourselves going vegan or vegetarian. Really these dollars can do a lot of good because you know, ads are so cheap, people are so fickle in some sense, um, and we can really do a whole lot of good. So when we're talking about effective altruism and strategies like you know, earning to give, going out and taking a higher earning career in order to donate large sums of money, um, it's just staggering how much good that can do for farmed animals, but also for other EA cause areas. Um, another intervention I'll cover is welfare improvements. So we discussed a little um, cage-free reforms, uh, getting people to switch their policies. They're doing it in other areas. For example, um, slowing down the growth of those chickens raised for meat so they have less cardiac failure and less of these issues. Of course, this isn't reducing all of their suffering. It's by no means the solution, um, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, and this, uh, we've also crunched the numbers. This is more robust. It doesn't involve as much speculation because it doesn't involve individual behavior change. And we get figures like this. Um, 12 to 25 years of factory farm suffering spared per dollar. So this is, I mean, just really staggering if you think about it. Um, you know, you could go out and buy a cup of coffee um, for, for, for the amount that could, you know, spare years of some of the worst suffering you could imagine. Doesn't mean we should stop buying coffee entirely, but it means that given we're in, you know, wealthy countries like the U.S. and Norway, um, we can potentially uh, give, you know, even just small fractions of our income and do a ton of good. Um, really inspiring to me, this is, you know, what gets me out of bed in the morning and makes me, you know, work so hard for animals. So even though I'm not earning to give, um, you could make a similar figure for hours put into activism. So hours put into, you know, creating those news stories that reach lots of people and get them to potentially change their diets, or if you're doing activism, getting corporations to change their policies, a similar effect. Um, also discuss animal-free foods. So this is a really exciting area. Um, this is a meatball but it's a meatball that I would eat. Um, it's the world's first cultured meatball. It's grown from animal cells, not from a whole animal. Um, and uh, basically, yeah, they take the cells that can be taken from a live you know, biopsy, uh, the same way we would do a medical biopsy to, to extract cells from a human. Um, they can be uh, replicated and proliferated uh, within cell culture. Um, and you can essentially, I mean, the science isn't uh, well developed in this area, but in theory, at least, you can, uh, replicate those indefinitely and, and never have to you know, raise another animal um, for food. And you can create meatballs like this, you could create hot dogs, you could create burgers um, and kind of feed the world and uh, without them even having to change their minds about what they're going to eat. They're eating the same thing, you just replace what's in the grocery store, you make it cheaper, you make it you know, healthier, you make it more sustainable, um, and people can kind of just switch on their own. 
So a really promising area. Um, unclear how much EAs can have an impact in it. So lots of the money in this area comes from investment, from like you know venture capital firms and this sort of thing. Um, it's not as clear what donations can do. Um, but we can get into that more. It's a, it's a challenging area to evaluate, but definitely very exciting um, and potentially really cost effective. So now I'm going to discuss a little bit about the far future and the context of animal-free foods. Um, so this is going to be a little bit complicated, but if you don't follow it, it's not a big deal, and I can explain it to you later. Um, so if we think about technology, so creating those new cultured meatballs versus social change, convincing people to you know, eat those meatballs, to go vegetarian, to go vegan, what have you, um, we face this trade-off where technology seems a lot better because you don't have to change people's minds. It's potentially really high leverage. Um, you can just change what's in front of people. You don't have to change their minds about anything. Um, social change seems hard to do well. Even though I've been optimistic about it, and I still am, um, it is a hard area. We don't have good randomized controlled trials, at least in the area of animal advocacy. Um, so does this mean we should focus on technology? Um, I would argue probably not, um, but it's not clear. Um, this is because technology mostly affects the speed of progress towards the future, um, and social change could affect the direction of progress. By this I mean that as we're increasing technology and developing new things like clean energy or clean meat, um, we're building on existing science in a way that goes in one direction. So technology always improves, unless we have some sort of social disaster that you know, destroys loads of scientific research. Um, so we're kind of speeding things up because we're just taking that one directional um, change and making it go faster. Um, social change, however, it's not clear what direction it goes. I mean, in, in Norway, I, I think you guys are doing pretty well, but in the US, we have like uh, Donald Trump right now, who <laughs> a lot of people think that this is actually negative progress. You know, humanity is retreating in some sense. Um, we've had like Brexit, things like this, um, that could make you think that really socially, um, we're not necessarily on a course towards, you know, utopia in some sense. Um, so if you make social change in the positive direction, you could be affecting the direction of the future. Um, to visualize this, um, we can think of speed as this. So um, you have the original timeline of humanity, kind of the progress of it at which things are improving, at which you know, new technologies are being created, et cetera. Um, if you speed things up by developing those technologies sooner, you kind of just shift the, the progress curve back a little um, to the left one that says with effort. Um, with technology, however, you can make it so that the original um, instead of being happening earlier, just goes up higher. So instead of, let's say, reaching a place where we've helped farmed animals, let's say everyone's went vegan, um, instead in the top curve, we've helped even wild animals. So now we have you know, grain agriculture that doesn't harm those rodents um, in fields who get you know, crushed up by the combines, for example, um, because we had additional uh, social change that happened. It could affect the direction of progress. Um, and if we think that kind of uh, humanity is going to last a very long time, at least it could last a very long time, um, then what happens at the end of this graph, at the, the, that far side, really matters a lot. Because here we've kind of captured this progress, that open area in the middle, um, which is great, fantastic work. Um, but in that area, we've actually changed what will happen indefinitely going into the future. So kind of as we get you know, more decades, more centuries, more millennium under our belts, we've created just more and more and more good. And this could become you know, astronomical. Um, so people might have heard of uh, these sorts of arguments in different areas of effective altruism. So they can also apply to things like uh, preventing the extinction of humanity. It could also affect this very long-term trajectory that could seem very important. Um, again, this is kind of an advanced topic. It's also a big simplification of a very complex topic. So happy to discuss further. Um, just kind of a teaser for you if you want to get more into EA research. Um, so now I'm going to talk about two arguments of kind of how we most effectively help animals. Um, first, I think we should focus more on institutional change instead of individual change. So earlier I presented two interventions, um, online ads and corporate policy reforms. Um, I personally favor the corporate policy reforms um, with you know, marginal funding, marginal hours um, for most people. Um, and I'm going to try and defend that here. Um, so first, I think there's historical precedent um, for this institutional approach. When we've looked at past social movements, for example, um, attaining women's suffrage or, or fighting against human slavery, um, we've seen that they've tackled it as an institution. They've said, um, you know, our goal from the get-go is to abolish slavery. Maybe we have an incremental step like abolishing the slave trade, but we're not doing it by creating, you know, one by one uh, slave owners who now don't own slaves. We're not doing it by one by one getting people to stop buying slave-made goods. There's actually an example of this um, in the U.S. movement, and it, it touched on some other areas, um, where anti-slavery activists um, tried to get people to just stop 
buying slave-made goods. It was called the free produce movement. Um, and this was seen largely as a failure by the movement itself. So it happened in about 1840 when it was developed. Um, William Lloyd Garrison, a very famous abolitionist, um, came to a convention saying, here's my uh, free produce wool coat. Um, you should all adopt the same policy and start buying uh, free produce goods. Um, William Lloyd Garrison, about 10 years later, um, came back to people and said, no, this was actually not very effective. It's a, not the best use of our research resources. We should stop doing this. Um, and this could have some similarities to the kind of go vegetarian, go vegan approach that we mostly see in the animal movement these days. Of course, there are differences. Again, this is just talk. It's a big simplification. Um, there's also historical a lot of historical precedent in environmentalism um, that I could talk about later. Um, second thing for institutional messaging and institutional approaches is that it avoids the collapse of compassion. So when we think about the, the huge scope, the scale that I talked about earlier of just these, you know, over a hundred billion animals killed every year, killed, raised and killed for food every year, even more wild uh, fish caught, not raised, but, but at least killed for food. Um, this can be really uh, overwhelming and really demotivating. It can make us very sad. It can make us um, have our compassion collapse, where we either get depressed and don't want to care, don't want to fight for the animals anymore, or we just say, you know, I don't care. I'm just going to ignore this issue. Maybe I make up a rationalization like, um, you know, society isn't going to change. We're always going to eat meat. Lions eat meat or something like this. Um, and I think we can avoid that by discussing like a large scale, long term route to success. Um, by talking about ending animal farming. So you notice that the title of this talk was not um, Effective Altruism and Creating More Vegans. It was Effective Altruism and Ending Farmed Animal Suffering. Um, I think that's both more motivating in the sense that it'll be more likely to get you to come to the talk, um, but also more motivating in the sense that it helps build our movement, helps get people excited, um, and helps us avoid this collapse of compassion. And there's some uh, psychological evidence uh, for this, which I could get into later. I um, mean, also another uh, evidence, piece of evidence from psychology is that it evokes moral outrage. So when we think of this institution, this kind of external entity of the animal agriculture industry as the guilty party, um, we can feel moral outrage. We can get really angry at it. Whereas if I, if I approach you and you're not already vegetarian and I say, hey, like you're the guilty party here, you really need to go vegetarian, um, you're gonna get very defensive. You're not gonna feel angry. You're gonna feel like uh, I'm attacking you and defensive, you're gonna make up excuses. And we want to avoid this when possible. We want to avoid that defensiveness. Instead, we want to get people riled up. We want to get people, uh, you might have seen those pictures earlier of the social movements, you know, rallying, uh, protesting in front of, you know, the Capitol, um, taking uh, steps to change society as a whole, becoming activists, becoming people who are earning to give, this sort of thing. I mean, I think we can do more of this with the institutional approach. Um, also peer pressure, so by framing it as a social decision, as a form of social change, um, we get people thinking that other people are doing it, which, as we talked about with online ads, is a really powerful tool for human motivation. Um, so I think there's more peer pressure kind of built into the institutional approach, institutional messaging. Um, finally, uh, there's a lot of leverage for institutional decision makers. So if you hear the, the kind of gossip, you know, late night stories that animal activists tell, about changing the policies of these corporations, it's often, you know, they were at, you know, the conference table having a, a discussion with, um, let's say the, the uh, I, I can't give too many specifics, but um, it seems like it's not sufficiently harder to make that less effective um, uh, than going out and talking to people on the street in, in many cases. But this is just a consideration in favor. Of course, because we're effective altruists and we want to uh, critically approach this, not just have somebody come up here and tell you all the reasons they're right, I'll also tell you the reasons I'm wrong. Um, we could have potential biases that, that make it incorrect to focus on the institutional framing. Namely, we could have kind of an ambition and excitement ourselves about wanting to end farmed animal suffering. And this makes us uh, think we should take the institutional approach and we should take this really high leverage approach when in reality we shouldn't and we're just getting too excited, too eager. Um, we could have a potential bias in the other direction, however. So we could have instant gratification where uh, when you try and create individual vegans or vegetarians um, or people, you know, taking other steps like uh, um, not consuming eggs from battery cage farms, for example, um, that that's really instantly gratifying. You immediately see a change. Your, your outcome is successful because this one person told you that they were going to go vegetarian. Um, so that could be a bias pushing us in the other direction. I think the strongest counter argument to the institutional approach is that it has a less clear call to action. So if I tell you like, hey buddy, do you want to like come with me and end animal farming? The other person's gonna be like, okay, sure. 
Um, but they're not going to know what to do about it. Whereas if I tell them, hey, like, uh, do you want to go vegetarian? They might not want to go vegetarian, but if they do, they'll have a clear step to how they do it. It's very, very actionable in that sense. Um, and I think this is a downside of the institutional approach and a reason to at least incorporate the individual framing. The way things are right now, at least, in, in most of the Western world, I would say, um, most people identify ending animal farming and these institutional goals with going vegetarian. Like, they know that that's an option. Um, and they know that if they embrace these broad arguments, they should do that. Um, so yeah, I don't think this is too strong, but I think it's, it's at least decently weighing against the institutional approach. Um, also, whenever you have that clear call to action and the instant behavior change that comes of it, um, that can lead to important effects. So um, do, do people know the term cognitive dissonance? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, yeah, cool. Oh, that's awesome. Um, wow, I don't think I would get that in, in America. I guess I haven't, I haven't asked that question. Um, so people have cognitive dissonance with, with you know, eating animals and thinking that animals have, have rights, have feelings, have interests. Um, so if you get people to just, in the short term, uh, not have that cognitive dissonance because they went vegetarian, for example, um, this can then allow them to change their attitudes more in the long run. Um, they've made a behavior change step that's affecting their attitudes. Um, this could be really important. It could help you um, create more stability. It could help you decrease recidivism. That person is going to be kind of committed to their new uh, outlook of the world. They're committed to activism or what have you. Um, and that could be really impactful for the individual approach. Um, finally, um, the institutional approach uh, affecting these high leverage decision makers usually needs to be done in, in, in large chunks. Uh, you need to tackle an entire corporation and maybe just the animal movement or at least the uh, vegan movement or whatever you want to call it um, is too small right now to really hope for this institutional change, at least on the scale of you know, ending animal farming or uh, ending it in a country or having 50% you know, change in uh, the consumption of animal products. Um, so maybe what we should be doing right now is just creating more individuals, more activists, uh, more vegans and vegetarians who can then be a support base for the institutional change in the future. Um, I think that we're probably at the point where we can hope for institutional change, but I think this is at least a downside of that argument. Um, so the second argument, which I'll go through more briefly before wrapping up the presentation, um, is that I think we need to focus more on how people make change for farmed animals, and not just why they should. Um, so my evidence for this, um, and I'll explain more what that means, um, is that whenever you're uh, having media reports and you're having people who get leaflets and these sorts of things, um, they often say, they think they should go vegetarian, they think there are compelling arguments, they know about farmed animal cruelty, they've seen an undercover investigation of a factory farm, um, but they don't know how, or they don't think it's realistic for them. Well, let's say they say they're an athlete. This happens all the time if you go out and pass out leaflets. Um, they say, hey, like, I actually really need a lot of protein, sorry, like, I know you want me to go vegetarian, but I can't. And they think like the conversation is done. Um, and then you tell them, like, no, actually, like, protein deficiencies are so uncommon, even among athletes. Um, actually, like, at least in the US, people are getting far beyond their recommended protein, um, even athletes. Um, the actual evidence for how much protein you need is pretty well fulfilled by just eating a uh, vegan diet that's high in you know, legumes and, and grains and these relatively high protein uh, foods. But anyway, people are struggling with the how. So maybe this is really what we need to combat now as a movement because we've spent so long showing people graphic videos, showing people why they, it's morally urgent that they need to go vegan, um, but we haven't told them how. Um, this could also relate to animal-free foods and uh, having more sophisticated products out there that are more compelling to, to people new to a vegan diet. Um, another piece of empirical evidence for this are the Facebook ads, as I discussed earlier. So I showed you one where it was compelling people to, to watch an undercover investigation video. That's not how all of them are done. Um, recently, I think just this year, um, people have been showing how uh, Facebook ads. So this just tells people, hey, do you want to go vegetarian? Uh, click this link and we'll give you a free vegetarian starter guide. Um, and tons of people click these. Tons of people click these. Tons of people sign up for the vegetarian starter guide. They uh, pledge to go vegetarian. Um, and it seems like this is a much more cost-effective way of creating uh, vegetarians through online ads. Um, so it's just one piece of empirical evidence, those higher pledge rates um, to go vegetarian for the, the how focus. Um, additionally, I think it's more neglected, as I mentioned or alluded to, um, I think we've focused a long time as a movement is you know, yelling at people and saying, hey, like, there are these really strong reasons why you need to go vegetarian. It's the same reason that we, when we want to get people to reuse their towels in hotels, um, we showed them the environmental message because we want people to be rational. We want people to think how they should think. We want to just give them the arguments of, you know, you're causing literally like the torture of animals with your diet. Can you please change that? Um, and that should be compelling to people, but it's unfortunately not. Um, and I don't think we've spent as much time on actually showing them how, actually showing them that it, 
you know, people in their peer groups are doing it, for example. We talked about how important peer pressure is. Um, I think this also avoids the collapse of compassion because people will see those investigation videos say, yeah, that really sucks, like that seems really bad, but I just don't care, you know, they're animals, they don't have the same feelings we do or something. Um, and I think it's very easy to, to retreat to this um, and to, to put up these walls um, when you're focused on the why. Whereas if you show them the how, then um, it, it's, it's easier for them to feel compassion because they feel like they can uh, then satisfy that compassion. They can uh, feel like they've, they've solved the problem that they've uh, accepted. Um, finally, uh, with animal-free foods, I think there's low-hanging fruit. Um, again, it's neglected. Not many people have um, actually been working towards creating these alternatives, at least in a way that's going to appeal to the general population. Most of the like vegan companies we have these days are for vegans. They're for a subset of the population. Um, they're focused on making like a really delicious veggie burger. And honestly, like we don't need really delicious veggie burgers. There are great ones out there. We need meat-like veggie burgers. We need the ones that people literally can't tell the difference between that and a, a burger made from a cow. Um, and we have these these days. So there's like the Impossible Foods burger that just came out in the U.S., um, which I've, I've been vegetarian for a long time, and it was, it was freaky. Like, I, I was worried that I was accidentally eating, you know, uh, like a piece of a cow or something, uh, because it had that, like, that richness of saturated fat, the metallic, irony taste. And these are things I don't crave at all as, as a vegetarian, um, but they're things that, uh, when you're making that first transition, are really important. Um, oh, finally, um, high recidivism rates. So we see that the vast majority, I wouldn't say vast, at like 80% or something of vegetarians stop being vegetarian at some point. Um, and when you talk to them about why they're doing that, it's usually how concerns. It's not a loss of motivation. Instead, it's saying like, well, I was going out to eat a lot and I actually you know, live in Texas where I'm from. Um, and there just weren't many vegetarian or at least vegan options. Excuse me. Like I, growing up, I mostly ate side dishes, you know, the, the beans, the, just the pot of beans would end up being my entree because there wasn't much else available. Um, so we could combat this with animal-free food tech with explaining to people how. So finally, how do we help? Um, how do we actually make a difference? Um, one thing we can do is, is participate in discussions and engage with the community. So you can join the Effective Animal Activism Discussion Facebook group. Um, I don't know, I, I'm sure there are like Norway vegan groups that you could join. Um, you could also join the Effective Altruism groups for Norway um, and this sort of thing. And this is a good way to kind of commit yourself and just get started. So you just have to click on it right now. Yeah, if you want to get on your phones right now, I'm totally fine with that. I know that's like a faux pas during presentations, um, but please do. Uh, feel free to join them or join them later. Um, and you can really just do that right now and get started, get engaged, get committed. Um, in the longer term, you can donate. Um, so we talk about an effective altruism, the idea of like donations versus hours you can put in versus other resources like political influence. Say you become a politician and then can then contribute that influence to an area like helping farmed animals. Um, EAA, Effective Altruism for Animals, or Effective Animal Advocacy, is probably the most funding-constrained cause area. Um, the other cause areas in Effective Altruism being things like helping the global poor, or building the EA movement itself, or um, helping with technologies to, to safeguard the future of humanity. Um, and Effective Altruism for Animals has a lot of really talented people in it, um, we, mainly because we have so many vegetarians and vegans in the world who would love to make a full-time career out of helping animals, um, but we don't have as much money. Um, so this could be really impactful. And if, if you aren't the best, suit for, um, best suited for like, earning to give and taking a high earning career, um, you could also uh, help build the movement in some sense that creates more funding down the road. Um, so work for an organization that's doing fundraising. You know, I was just in Berlin for a few weeks. There's a group called Raising for Effective Giving. That's uh, uh, fundraising from people who have a lot of money and don't know what to do with it, like uh, poker players. Um, and this can be really effective because it helps bring more funding into a very funding constrained cause area. Um, my organization, Animal Charity Evaluators, um, we are mainly a charity evaluation organization, so we have a list of top charities that you can donate to. Um, I don't know about the tax deductibility in Norway, um, so you could also talk to me or discuss specific opportunities in Norway, um, this sort of thing, but yeah, it's a starting point at least. Um, if you do want to work directly for the cause, look for talent gaps. So this is the idea that um, many people are willing to do certain jobs in the movement, but not willing to do others. So uh, take, for example, like uh, managing an organization or starting your own organization. There are lots of people who want to do this. It's very attractive to be the leader of a group, to be the spokesperson of a group. Um, it's not as attractive to do something like undercover investigations, you know, where you, you, at least while you're doing the work, can't even publicize that you're doing it. Um, you're just day in and day out actually working with animal abusers at factory farms. Um, and this could potentially be a really 
impactful area to, to work in, to commit professionally. Um, also right now we need a lot of really professional people, a lot of people who are willing to like talk to company executives um, and help pass you know, corporate reforms for animals. And uh, I, as much as I want to combat vegan stereotypes, a lot of vegans are not the most professional people. They're you know, kind of hippies um, and they might not be best suited for that. Maybe they should be doing other areas. So if you are a professional and you, know, you want to engage with corporations, maybe you have an opportunity here. Um, finally, you can do research. Um, this is what I do, so I obviously find this a compelling argument. Um, you can comp contribute to the knowledge base we have. You can help run studies like the one I discussed earlier. Um, and doing this to some small degree helps you understand just the research in the field and the research in psychology in general. And it can help you uh, get that awareness that then helps you in your other activism or your other donations and this sort of thing. Um, so you could just write a blog post, for example, on a, on a movement you've been interested in. Say you're really interested in feminism. Um, then you could write a blog post on lessons the animal movement can learn from feminism, for example. Um, this could contribute to, to directly and then also you know, help you improve as an activist. Um, so that's it. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you all so much for coming.